right, well, again, welcome everybody, all of our friends who are joining us online. We're continuing in a series of messages that we're calling Awake. And what we're really talking about is spiritual awakening. Some people use the, the word revival or the word renewal to describe a work of God in our lives. But an awakening is something that's much larger. In fact, if you look at history, there have been three significant great awakenings spiritually that have deeply impacted our particular nation. And each time this has happened, there's been such a profound, widespread effect that it literally changed our entire culture and our entire nation. And so a true spiritual awakening is way beyond one particular church or a series of services. It's a dramatic move of God in the hearts of people, drawing them closer to his heart. And I don't know about you guys, but I really feel like America right now is positioned for another great spiritual awakening. And uh, we need it. I believe that the soil has is, is been prepared. And we're looking forward to the great things that we believe God's going to do uh, in our world. Now, you can't plan for a move of God. You can't make it happen. But, but we can prepare for a move of God. And that's what we're focusing on in this series. Preparing for just awakening. Positioning our hearts. Now, what we're talking about in this series is really three values. What we're all about as Christ followers, and particularly a local church, uh, we're gospel-centered, spirit-empowered, and mission-focused. All right? So this is how we prepare our hearts, is to dive deep into these values. And a couple weeks ago, we talked about this whole idea of being gospel-centered. Two weeks ago, I introduced you to the, or reminded you, of the Greek word agape, which is in the New Testament describing the unconditional love of God and how an understanding of God's unconditional love is truly a foundation towards uh, being a gospel-centered person. It's irrational. It's unconditional. None of us earn or deserve that type of love, but that's how God loves us. What's really interesting is that God has established three earthly institutions to just give us a glimpse, a little taste of what his unconditional love is all about. First of all, God established the family. And God's intention was that the family would be a place where we're provided for and protected. But most importantly, within that family environment, absolute unconditional love for members of that family. Now, we all know that not all families uh, actually live out those values 100%. Some of you had a broken, maybe dysfunctional family, but God's original intent was that that family environment give us a glimpse of what the love of God is truly all about in, in his plan. Secondly, he established marriage to be an expression of what his love is all about. When a married couple stands at the altar, when they get married, they make these vows, they enter into this covenant, and what do they say? For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Right? It's a commitment to unselfishly loving that person for the rest of our lives together. And it's challenging to live up to that commitment. And there are times in marriage that it's not always the perfect picture of that unconditional love that God desires for us. Again, we never get a true, accurate picture because as human beings, we're flawed. We're sinful, right? How many of you, just poke somebody next to you and say, listen, he's talking about you right now. Flawed and sinful, okay, that's, that's you. So um, we get a glimpse, though, of what it can be in this world, but that unconditional love is really a, just a little taste of God's unconditional love. We can see it in the family. We can see it in marriage. We also are to see it in the church. God established the church to be a place where we love each other that way. We accept each other. We're patient with each other. And we're, we're committed to one another. And that's what God meant for the church. Now, we all know that sometimes churches aren't that. Sometimes they can be mean, judgmental, looking down their nose at people, feeling somehow spiritual superior, spiritually superior and, and even hateful sometimes. So again, God's ideal is to be an expression of his love because of our human weaknesses sometimes it doesn't always come out that way. Now, if you had a bad experience in any one of these three reflections of the love of God, congratulations, you have some baggage. All right? Now, you may have Louis Vuitton baggage. 
nice and designer, all right, but it's still baggage nonetheless. And what God wants to do is help us to heal and move on and not stay stuck. Because if we stay stuck, then it becomes an impediment to the growth of our relationship with God. So he, he wants to help us unpack our baggage to be healed and whole and to experience his best for our lives. And the way that we do that, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is going to be the practical application of the gospel. So we talked about being gospel-centered. So this is the second half of that one principle. Not only is it about the love of God, but it's about applying these truths about the gospel to our lives, how we live. Now today what I'm going to do is you're going to use marriage as an illustration. This is not a marriage teaching or a sermon, but we are going to use this as an illustration of all this, this principle that we're going to develop. You know, in December of 1986, Gina and I got married. And I was about 21 years old, so for those of you who are doing math at home, you can figure that out for yourself. But December of 1986, here's a little snapshot of the couple, right? Little babies, and I was rocking my mullet. Gina's looking all cute and fine, right? So there we were. And in that moment that we said I do, in December of 1986, and we had the reception, and we got in the car, and we drove away in my little Dodge Colt hatchback. It had, you know, soap writing, just married all over it, and tin cans dragging from the bumper. As we drove away from that church, we were fully married. There's no way we could be more married than we were in that moment. 100% fully married. Today, in November of 2020, we've been married now for 33 years, and we are still fully married. Now, we're no more married now than we were in 1986. We've been married longer, but our position in that marriage covenant has been unchanged. Now, here's the reality. At some point in the future, one or both of us will pass away. One of us are going to die, or both of us are going to die. And at that moment, we will die fully married, 100% married, the covenant unchanged. So we're going to be married fully until we die. But here's the deal, and this is what we need to be challenged with. It is actually possible to be fully married but not have a full marriage. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. It's possible to be fully married in that position of covenant, but not actually have a full marriage. What can happen is because of our human weaknesses and imperfections and other dynamics in our lives, we can be in a situation where we're in an empty marriage. Fully married, yet with an empty marriage marriage. So we can die married, yet at the very end of everything, be left with an empty marriage if we're not careful. Now, that's exactly, by the way, what the devil wants for every single married couple in this room. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He does not want you to experience God's best for your life. Jesus said in John 10, I've come that you might have life, life in all of its fullness, full, rewarding, meaningful life. That's what he wants for your marriage. Full, rewarding, meaningful. All those things in your heart that you really desire, he wants that in that relationship. Now, there's some needs that your spouse can never meet. That's what God is for. But he wants that relationship to be healthy and growing and satisfying. That's his intent. That's, that's his desire. But see, what we don't want at the very end is to be left without that fullness. So the devil wants you to be left empty in that marriage. God wants you to experience fullness in your marriage. Now, here's the deal. Consider this. Yes or no? The greatest factor, determining factor, as to whether our marriage is empty or full is based on the choices that we make, yes or no, okay? So the choices that we make impact whether we have a full or an empty marriage. Now, let's consider the Old 
Testament. We're going to look at the Old Testament covenant because it's similar to a marriage covenant. Then we're going to look at the New Testament coverage or covenant, which is actually the basis for an actual wedding covenant. All right? The Old Testament covenant in the Old Testament in your Bible is based on what's known as a suzerain vassal covenant. The way to think of a suzerain vassal covenant would be like a landlord and a tenant who is renting from them. So the landlord writes up a lease, the, the, the suzerain, right, the landlord, and the vassal, the renter, signs the lease. In the lease agreement, there are specific stated expectations about what happens. And if you do all these things, then here are the things that, that I will do. If you don't do these things over here, then here's, here's what I'm going to do. And it's stated in the lease. When you rent the house, you put down your security deposit, you pay your rent every month. If you don't pay your rent, you can't stay in the house. If you, at the end of your rent, let's pay your, you pay your rent every month. At the end, when your lease is over, if you've trashed the place, the landlord's going to keep your deposit, right? Because it was all stated in the lease. This was the agreement, and this is the nature of a suzerain vassal uh, covenant. So this is the nature of the Old Testament covenant. The suzerain is the empowered, strong person in the relationship. The vassal is the dependent, weaker partner in the relationship. We can see this in the way nations operate. Nations, a stronger nation may have a neighboring, weaker nation. The stronger nation is very strong economically, very strong militarily. The weaker nation is much weaker in those areas, but the weaker nation may have some natural resources that the stronger nation wants or needs. The weaker nation may have access to, to rivers or ports that the stronger nation, nation wants. So what they'll do is they'll enter into this suzerain vassal covenant that basically says, hey, we're the stronger nation. We'll protect you militarily. If anyone ever attacks you, it'll be like they're attacking us. And we're going to watch over and protect you guys, but here's what's going to happen. You're going to allow us to enjoy some of those natural resources that you have. And we're going to have access to your ports or whatever it is. And there's a mutual agreement, and they come into covenant together through some type of treaty. Is this making sense to everybody? All right, suzerain vassal covenant. And this is basically the nature of the Old Testament covenant that you see that God made with Abraham and with Israel. It was a suzerain vassal covenant. God established this covenant. He wrote up the lease, which is found in the Torah, 613 commands. God says, listen, you guys live this way, and Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to make you like no other nation on the earth. I'm going to just show myself powerful on your behalf. I'm just asking you to live this way. And if you guys mess up, I'm going to have a sacrificial system. So you have to go to this earthly priest that I'm going to establish. There's going to be a system of sacrifice to have your sins forgiven. So when you make your mistakes, I've got that covered. Just follow through on this process that I'm establishing. This is all a part of the lease. As long as you follow the terms of the lease, I'm going to bless you and prosper you and make your name great in the world. So God, in love, established this covenant with Israel thousands of years ago. Because his desire was that as a nation, Israel would be a reflection of who he is and his power in this world. But of course, there was a problem. While Israel was faithful to God, things went great. They were blessed and prosperous. But we know the history of Israel has been a cycle of them being prosperous and everything going great, and then they forget God. And they would start looking at the other nations living around them and all the trendy idols that they would worship and the other things that they were into. And they started becoming like the nations around them, rebelling against God, turning their back on God and the covenant they made with them. And whenever they did that, God said, oh, guess what? You're not fulfilling your end of the bargain. So you know what? I'm stepping back. So every time Israel rebelled, what would happen to Israel? They would get plundered by other nations taken into slavery, sickness and disease often came, famine, oppression. And here's how the cycle would go. After years of misery, 
and desperation. They finally are in enough pain that they cry out to God and say, God, we are so sorry. We turned against your covenant. We've rebelled against you. God, would you please forgive us? Guess what? God would forgive them and he would accept them. And he'd once again return his blessing upon them because God is always faithful to his covenant. So Israel's cycle is a cycle of obedience and disobedience. But God always has this covenant. By the way, if you're always wondering why Christians are so committed to Israel as a nation and the well-being of Israel, it's because Israel is precious to God's heart. He is, he, they are his precious possession, the apple of his eye. And so God so wants to bless Israel, and that's why as a, even as a nation, we, we want to bless Israel and we want to support them because of what we see in this biblical covenant that God made with them. Now right now as a nation, Israel is not following God, but the Bible says one day all of Israel is going to turn their hearts back towards God. And God is going to fulfill, continue to fulfill his promise to the covenant that he has made with them. So Israel's cycle is the cycle of disobedience and then repentance. And what God was doing with Israel was establishing a principle that he was going to fulfill in a new covenant. So he established this old covenant in the Old Testament with Abraham, the nation of Israel. But it was all leading to a new and better covenant that he was going to establish. It's described here in the book of Hebrews. Are you guys tracking with me today? Okay, because we're kind of digging in deep on the teaching a little bit. Everybody, everybody wave at me if you're hanging with me. Okay, you hanging with me? Okay, so Hebrews 8, 6 and 7. But now Jesus, our high priest, remember the high priest that the Old Testament, right, the Israelites had, the way to get their sins forgiven and stuff was to go through the sacrificial system. That was the old covenant. But now we have a new covenant. Jesus is our high priest. And he's being given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God. Based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. So again, he's using language here. The writer of Hebrews is using that language of the suzerain vassal covenant, understanding this is the old way and the old path. But now God has a new mediator, a new better covenant. Jesus, a once and for all sacrifice. The old covenant, every time you messed up, you had to go make sacrifice. Now Jesus becomes the once and for all sacrifice, not only just for the Jewish people, but for all of mankind. And he's the one who brings us back into good standing with God. By the way, if you keep reading to the end of the chapter here in Hebrews, he specifically says not only does the second covenant replace it, but he actually says the old covenant is obsolete. So we have this new covenant based on better promises through faith in Jesus Christ. So we see Jesus Christ as the one mediator between God and man. When we put our faith in him, what happens? New covenant, based on what we talked about two weeks ago. We enter into the agape, unconditional love of God. So the new covenant is not a suzerain vassal relationship. The new covenant is that God invites us into his family as joint heirs with Christ. Jesus actually called us brothers, sisters. He's, he's saying, listen, you're going to become a part full heirs to this full spiritual inheritance that I have for you. So this is a full covenant, a completely better covenant than the old covenant. So this unconditional love, this this. Uh, the fact that, okay, when I put my faith in Jesus, when I step out of line and when I disobey, my relationship with God is not on the line. God's acceptance of me is not based on my fulfillment of rules and regulations or 613 commands in the Torah. God's acceptance of me is not based on what I do. It's based on what Jesus has already done for me on the cross. 
So I put my faith in his finished work on the cross. Now here's a key principle we need to get a hold of. Just like in marriage, it is possible to be fully saved and not be living a full life. You can be fully married and not have a full marriage. You can also be fully saved through faith in Jesus and not be living a full life. See, through faith in Jesus, we have, you know, salvation. It can't be taken away from us. It won't be taken away from us. We know that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. The question, though, is not, you know, after we've secured that situation of knowing that we're accepted by God and heaven is going to be our home one day, that next question kicks in. What type of life do you want to live? Let's go back to marriage as our example. What type of marriage do you want to have? If your spouse one day, remember we talked about this two weeks ago, if your spouse came down, to, sat you down on a couch one day, said, hey, honey, no matter what you do, I'm never going to leave you. You could cheat on me. You could mistreat me. In any, but you know what? I am going to stand by you. My love for you is absolutely unconditional. Right? If, if your spouse said that to you, would you take that as a license to do whatever you want? Or would you say, you know what? I want a full marriage. So I'm going to do some things that are going to make our marriage better. See, we have to consider that. Because when we go back to our chart here, what is it that makes a full marriage? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is a really great example. What if you had a marriage that was full of love? I mean, just unconditional love. Some of you may remember Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages. And he talks about these different ways that we can communicate love to our spouse in a way that they can understand it and really receive it. And, you know, we have, you know, lo the love language of, of words of affirmation. Uh, we have quality time, physical touch, gifts, you know, acts of service. So we all feel loved different ways of those, those different love languages. So what we want to do is discover our spouse's love language and love them that way, in the way that makes them feel loved. What if your marriage was two people 100% committed to loving each other that way, unconditionally? How many of you would say that that would be a good, that would be a good thing for your marriage, okay? I, I think it would. What if your marriage was full of joy? What if your marriage was full of peace? What if your marriage was full of patience? Hey, listen, I know you messed up, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be patient with you. It's going to be okay. You'll figure it out, and I'm here for you. What if you had heaping doses of that in your marriage? Some of you are laughing right now. Okay, we're just going to move on. What if your, your marriage was full of kindness? What if your marriage was full of goodness and faithfulness? How many of you would agree that faithfulness to your spouse is a pretty important thing in marriage, right? What if you had never had any question about that? How about gentleness, self-control? If we had all the fruit of the Spirit listed for us in Galatians chapter 5, we had all these fruit active in our marriage, our marriage would absolutely be full. But how do you know we don't, have those always activated all the time in marriage, right? We, we sometimes kind of drop the ball. So what does an empty marriage look like? It's the contrast of all of these. Instead of love, there can be hate in a marriage. Instead of joy, sadness. Instead of peace, chaos and drama. Instead of patience, impatience. Instead of kindness, meanness. Instead of goodness, badness. I don't even know if that's a word, but I just figured I'd put it up there. <laughs> right? Goodness and badness. Uh, faithfulness. What if there was unfaithfulness? Gentleness versus harshness. Self-control versus impulsive. See, every marriage from time to time, if we're honest, as an individual we're going to find ourselves falling into some of this empty behavior. 
that does not help the relationship. Yes? Can we all just be honest about that? But see, there's no, there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. What we should strive for is for a healthy marriage. And when we realize we're doing anything to contribute over here, what we want to do is change that behavior because ultimately it's a win-win situation. We both begin to experience the fullness of what God has in mind for that marriage relationship when we're both fully committed here. So this should change the way we approach our spouse and the way we focus on our marriage because it's a question of how do I really want to live my life? So being fully married is like being fully saved, right? Unconditional love. There's no vassal relationship here. The ideal marriage is where I'm choosing fullness rather than contributing to to emptiness. Now again, marriage, just like uh, the church, just like every other human institution, though they were meant to help us get a glimpse of the love of God, it's never perfect because none of us are ever perfect. Sometimes we have to deal with our baggage. Sometimes we have to realize the hurt that we experienced in our family wasn't what God wanted. The hurt that we experienced in our marriage was not what God wanted. Maybe that church hurt that we experienced, we have to realize, hey, that's not what God wanted. And so these are all imperfect And a family can fail and be splintered. A marriage can fail. A church can fail when it lives over here. Keep sowing that type of seed, bad stuff will grow in that garden. And so what we want is to invest in the the other side. And the same decision to say, hey, I want my marriage over here, I have to make some choices. I have to make some changes to my behavior and see some things happen over here. The same is true of our relationship with God. So what type of marriage do I want? Important question. More important question. What type of relationship with God do I want? How do I want to live my life? The fact is I can be fully saved, but not living a full life. See, our motivation for serving God and worshiping God and and walking in obedience is all the motivation to say, God, this is what I want over here. I want to honor the sacrifice you made for me. I want to honor you because you're the one who showed me love first while I was still a sinner. When I was out cheating on you, you still loved me. And so I want to love you back. I want to honor you and I want to serve you. See, our motivation for serving God and pleasing God is not guilt or obligation or fear or manipulation. It's that, God, I want to honor you and respond to your unconditional love. Do you want to live full? Because the alternative as a follower of Jesus is to live on that empty side. You can be saved and going to heaven yet be constantly dealing with the heartache and the pain and the frustration of the consequences of sinful decisions. There is bad fruit. There are bad natural consequences to disobedience. And I know Christians, they love God. They're ready for heaven, but they've destroyed their marriage through bad fruit. Love God going to heaven, but they're involved in all kinds of immorality that's destroying their life and their heart scarring their mind and their spirit. And and God loves them, but they're making poor choices that are negatively affecting their life on a daily basis. So the question is, just like in marriage and our relationship with God, how do we move from here to get over here? As a follower of Jesus, the way we do that is to renew our mind. That's how we make that shift. In Romans chapter 7, Paul prays this prayer that I'm sure many of us could probably relate to. Oh, wretched man that I am. Man, I'm so frustrated with myself. The things I know I should be doing, I'm not doing them consistently. The things that I don't want to be doing, man, I find myself doing all that bad stuff that brings bad fruit. And I don't want to do that. 
Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? How can I get free of this? Paul would say the problem is not the commandments of God in the Bible. The problem is me. And then he says, thanks be to God because of Jesus Christ. He's provided a new way for me to relate to God. He is the one who delivers me. In Romans 8, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. He goes on for 11 chapters to describe this new life that we have in Jesus Christ, who you are in Jesus. Then he gets all the way up to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, which is the application of what we're talking about today. I want to see if we can all read this out out loud together with our outside voices. Everybody, come on, read this with me. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Paul understood. Hey, listen, man, you're fully saved. You can't get any more saved than you are right now once you put your faith in Jesus, but that doesn't mean you're living in the fullness of Christ. So don't be conformed to the pattern of this world that's always constantly trying to mold you into its mold. Do you guys feel that pressure every day where the world's telling you, hey, you need to think this way. You need to live this way. You need to value what we value. You need to follow all the trendy, popular idols that the whole world is worshiping right now. Follow the world's rules and the world's value system and the games that they play. We're under constant pressure. You see, the Bible says, as a follower of Jesus, I've been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ in me. When we baptize someone, that's what we're saying. Not only was, you know, we dip them in the water because not only was, did Jesus die and was buried and rose again, I too died to my sin, my old way of life when I put my faith in Jesus, and I've been raised again to new life in Christ. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to Christ. But let's just be real. You guys ready for reality? If you put your faith in Jesus, you're dead to sin and alive to Christ. But how many of you know that the flesh always wants a resurrection? The flesh is constantly wanting to come back and take control. New Testament talks about this constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. Our fleshly desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life is constantly at war with the spirit of God who is living on the inside of us. And so what we have to do is be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I think it's really important where this second part here, he says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world, but let God. Everybody say, let God. So you and I have to make a choice to let God do this work on the inside of us. See, a renewed mind is reminding yourself who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ. So important. See, look at this. We can stay full spiritually when we constantly renew our mind. We don't need to search for something. We need to be reminded of what we have. See, most people, when they see themselves struggling with different things on that empty side we were talking about earlier, it's like, oh, you know, I need to turn over a new leaf. I need a new spouse. I need a new job. I need to live and move to a new city. But God says, no. What you need is a renewed mind. You need me to change you from the inside out. You can move anywhere in the country, but you're still, you still have you with you. And you still got to deal with you. You got to still deal with what's going on in your heart. Oh, God, I need more love. No, I've already given you love. The Holy Spirit's living in you. And when he came and moved into your life, he brought with you that list of all those fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He brought them with him. If you put your faith in Jesus, that's in you. What you and I need to learn to do is to submit and surrender to the Holy Spirit and allow him to bear that fruit in our lives. 
So we're going to talk about next week, we talk about being spirit-empowered, allowing the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. I don't need more of all these qualities. I just need to allow God to work them out in my life because they're already there. You're already a new person in Christ. The old has passed away. All things have become new. You and I need to stop allowing the world to conform us and be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to remind ourselves of who we are. That's what it means to be awakened, is to remind ourselves of who we are and what God has given us. Man, Pastor Dave, I'm so frustrated with myself. How can I be so angry and be a Christian? Why do I always struggle with these lustful thoughts? How, how can I be real or Christian? How can that be? Well, it's actually easy. If you don't renew your mind, your flesh is going to want to take control. So as a follower of Jesus, I have to choose that conformed path. We renew our mind Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and every day of the week. We don't have to pray, Lord, give me more. It's like, God, I thank you that you've already given me everything I need. I have a full inheritance of your power, of your presence, all the fruit of your spirit in my life. I just need to yield to the Holy Spirit. Give him more control. You don't need more of God in your life. He needs more of you. I don't quantitatively need more of God's spirit. I need to allow his spirit to have more control of me. That's what we're talking about. You can be married. And if you are married, you're not any more married today than you were on the day that you got married. And it's your choice. Choices that affect whether you have a full marriage or not. If you put your faith in Jesus, you're saved. You're forgiven. You're as ready for heaven as if you were already there. The question is, what type of life do you want to live? God loves you. He cares about you. He's accepted you. He's forgiven you. He does all those things, whether you're sitting right here in church or you're sitting in cell block E at the prison. He loves you just the same. You just have to decide, what type of life do I want? And my choices are what's going to lead me down one path or another. So it may not be as extreme as doing something illegal enough to get sent to prison, but every day we're imprisoned at times by the consequences of disobedience, poor choices. We're wrestling with the pain of bad decisions and sinful actions. God is saying, listen, there's a better way. You can live a better way. You can have a renewed mind. So to wrap up today, it's very simple. How do you want to live? What type of fruit do you want to see in your life? God doesn't want you to have to live with the brokenness that comes from disobedience and all the consequences attached to that. He wants you to experience his new life, that fulfilling, rewarding life that he promised. I want us to pray together. Would you bow your heads with me, everybody? Very simply today, I'm going to invite you as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, if you've already put your faith in him, surrendered your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to recommit yourself today to not be conformed to the image of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It might be a really good thing for you to spend some time this week reading through Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8 just getting reminded of what God has done in your life, what he's promised you, who you are in Jesus. Maybe you need to pray a prayer that says, God, would you forgive me for making choices that lead to emptiness? I want to make choices that lead to fullness. I want to experience your best. I want to reflect your best to this world. Father, we thank you for your help. We thank you for the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that we're not alone, but God, you empower us to be the people that you've called us to be. Help us to learn to yield in Jesus' name. And as we close, again, everybody said bow and eyes close. If you're here and you've never, or maybe it's been a long time since you've put your faith in Jesus, 
as the ultimate sacrifice for your sins, that he took your sin upon himself and he paid the price for sin that you really deserved. He took your place on that cross. If you've never accepted that reality, if you've never put your faith in him today, there's a great day for you to experience his new life, his salvation, his acceptance, his forgiveness, that unconditional love that I was talking about. He is so ready to show you that. And if you realize you need to make that step, we don't embarrass people here. I'm not going to have you stand up or come down here to the front. I just want you to be honest. And as the pastor here, I'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you. If you need to make that step today to put your faith in Jesus, just put your hand just where I can see it real quick, up and down, and then I'm going to pray for you. God already sees your heart. Yes, yes, yes. You can put your hand right back down. God sees. He knows. Thank you, Lord. Three or four, five. God bless you. If you raise your hand just in your heart, just say, Lord, here I am. I realize I'm a sinner who needs your forgiveness. And I come to you today. I humble myself and I ask for you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins, and that he rose again. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would change me from the inside out. God, make all things new. That's what you promised to do. Thank you that you've forgiven me, that everything and anything in my past is covered and forgotten. And today I leave this building with a fresh start, with a new life. And I thank you for loving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together and thank God for his love today?